Welcome everyone to Geography of Hope. It's so great to have you guys here tonight with photographer Peter Mather. I'm just super excited to have him with us here. I'm Hillary Stamper and I'm the Director of Member Engagement of Alaska Wilderness League. I'm calling in from Half Moon Bay, California, the traditional land of the Ohlone people. Um, thank you for joining us for Hidden Wonders of the Western Arctic with Peter. A few quick housekeeping items. Participants are going to be muted for the duration of the program to help assure everyone has the best listening experience possible. And we're going to try to field questions during the show. You can type in questions throughout the program, and we may also save some for the end um, during a Q&A session. So feel free to type in, um, and Peter may answer some in real time, and we may also save some for the end of the show. If for any reason you missed part of tonight's program or want to listen again, it's being recorded and we'll send the link to you shortly. And with that, I'm so excited to introduce Peter. I'm going to get him up here on the screen. Okay. Hello, everyone again. Um, I'm going to just let in one more batch of people. There we go. Um, so Peter is a photojournalist and award-winning wildlife photographer from Whitehorse, Yukon. His work focuses on wildlife, wilderness, people, and communities in Northern Canada and Alaska. And we have been so incredibly lucky at Alaska Wilderness League to feature many of his stunning photographs in our work to protect the Arctic. I cannot say enough about how much we value Peter's ability to bring all of us to Alaska through his images. He just captures the magic and wonder of these spectacular landscapes and the lives that depend on them in a way we could never do with words. And it's so important in our work. Um, Peter is also a fellow in the International League of Conservation Photographers. He's represented by National Geographic Image Collection and Minden Pictures. And he's an ambassador for Panasonic cameras. So with that, I would love to turn the mic over to you, Peter, and let you get us started. Hey, thanks a lot, Hillary. Yeah, it's real nice to be here, folks. I'm uh, I'm actually right now in Thailand. Um, it's like 6 a.m. for me, and I haven't eaten in the last 48 hours because I have a stomach bug, and I haven't <laughs> shaved either. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, things are, uh, um, you know, I'm pretending to complain, but when you're in Thailand, it's hard to complain, folks. It's a good life. Um, I see someone from Haines, Alaska. That's pretty cool. Hi to Thomas. Um, I'm going to just jump into my presentation. So I'm going to steal the screen and just jump in. And uh, like Hillary said, ask questions as we go. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about uh, a little bit what, where I'm from and in, in my like photography career and my photography story. Uh, all the things that I'm going to kind of uh, put together tonight are going to be um, related to like the photography stories that I've worked on. Um, and and this is the first thing I want to show you is a picture of a red fox over my hometown of Whitehorse. I live in Whitehorse in the Yukon Territory, which is right beside Alaska. And so I'm based out of there. So I do most of my work in the Yukon and in Alaska. So those are the two primary places where I do my photography. It's all Northern work. And um, I started, see here, I'm trying to move the photos. <laughs> Sorry, I just have a little technical glitch on moving photos. Um, I just wanted to kind of t t tell you about a, a photo story I started in Whitehorse to start, and it's about these uh, red foxes. Uh, it was during uh, uh, like uh, coronavirus, uh, COVID. It was, you know, we were locked down, everywhere was locked down. And so I wasn't going out doing photography trips anymore. I was just kind of like, uh, like it was the best time of my life. This photo which features my dog. My dog's name is Luke Skywalker. And, and we were walking downtown one time and we came across this fox who was like really aggressive. And he was barking at us and kind of like chasing us off. So we couldn't figure out, you know, exactly what was going on. So I took my dog home and um, I went downtown on my own again. And I and I thought, so went for this fox was because I thought, oh, there must be a den around. And, you know, I started looking around and I found this den uh, in downtown Whitehorse. And uh, 
Yeah, yeah, one of the cool things about these foxes are like uh they're like they're kind of known as thieves. They go around into neighborhoods and they steal people's shoes and baseball gloves and anything leather. And then they just compile they, they they steal them and they just pile them up in their yard for their kids to play with. And it's a cool thing in Whitehorse because at the end of the year, you get all these uh people who like put all these items that have been stolen from the neighborhood on their front lawn. So there's like a hundred items on their front lawn for people to come and pick up again. Um, you know, that have been stolen. It's all work gloves and 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 shoes and such. And so uh Whitehorse is, is a, a town of about 30,000 people. And uh, I started looking to do a story on foxes, on these urban foxes. And, you know, quickly I found uh, 20 fox dens within our little community. You know, so there's just a ton of foxes living in this community. Um, and it was kind of neat too, because like it was, you know, COVID was a tough time for people. Um, but where we were, we, we didn't have much COVID at all. We didn't have any COVID and we had a lot of freedom. We were still able to kind of walk around places. And it was kind of the happiest time of my life because all I did was walk my dog, Luke Skywalker, for four hours every day. And we would go around looking for fox tins and, uh, and photographing foxes. It was, a, it was a, a grand adventure, really. And we found out, like, I found like most foxes would be denning uh, under like uh, buildings, like abandoned buildings or sheds and behind fences. Almost all the 20 dens I found um, were, were doing that. And one of the cool things about these foxes were that uh, we, have, we, have, we have we have like an indigenous population who often lives on the street in our community. And, and the, 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 the foxes were like pets for uh, a lot of the street people living on the street, you know, like, and so it was really cool because I got to meet all these street people, really nice people. They don't always live on the street, but sometimes they're on the street. And they had all these foxes as pets. And I even had a, a, a friend who I used to teach. I used to be a teacher up in this community of Old Crow. And he used to be a student of mine. And he lived on the streets in Whitehorse for a while. And when he was living on the streets, you know, he found out that the fox was his spirit animal. Um, and that the fox saved his life because he was into some bad stuff. And he would just follow these foxes around all the time. And they brought so much like positive energy to him. He kind of changed his, his life around. And now he's uh the the Gwich'in leader in in Canada in terms of like um documenting and capturing um and, and kind of sharing old stories from a long time ago like from hundreds of years ago 100 year old Gwich'in stories so it's a really neat story of these foxes and the connections they have with the people that are kind of like from the original land um there was this one fox family and they had denned for about a week in the parking lot of McDonald's, which is like the busiest place in our town. It's busy in place in most towns. And they would just come out at night and feed and stuff. Um, yeah, eventually they were moved on by like the uh, conservation officer because uh, you know it wasn't a very safe place for a fox family to be. And they had another secondary den that they went to. And I guess the biggest issues in, in our community because like all the stories they do are kind of based around wildlife and some of the issues they have. And the biggest issue in our community is like people throw a lot of food out their windows when they're driving. You know, you're eating a chicken wing and you have this little chicken bone and people just throw it out the window. And so a lot, what happens is the foxes go out when they get a little older, when they're like uh, in August, they leave their homes uh, to go out on their own and, and they're just getting their own food and they end up going out on roads to find food and then they get hit by cars. And so, you know, that's one of the things that we're trying to, to educate people about in our community is, is how to, like, uh, you know, keep these foxes as part of our community and keep them safe. And they always like, uh, all the foxes like having a really high point, you know, <laughs> they go way up high where they can, like, uh, watch over everything because they, they got to look out for dogs because dogs can really cause them a lot of trouble. And uh, they got to look out for coyotes. Coyotes are the big uh, predator of baby foxes. And they'll come into the community and try to find a den and, and get a, a free meal. So the foxes are always up on high, looking out for, uh, for any potential issues for their babies. But that was just kind of like a little background on me and the kind of work I do and uh, in my community. But most of the stuff I'll be talking about today has to do with like Alaska's uh, Arctic. 
And this is a photo of a village called Arctic Village. It's right on the edge of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. It's a Gwich'in village of about 250 people. The only way you can get there is by flying or snowmobile. Um, and it's, uh, these people are very, they're caribou people, the Gwich'in people, they're connected to the caribou really closely. And I started my story working with these people um, and photographing stories with the Gwich'in and the caribou people when I was um, at, uh, at university. And as soon as I graduated from university as a teacher, I went to uh, Old Crow, which is very similar to this village. Old Crow is like this, but in Canada, it's another fly-in village. Um, and it has got, uh, you know, the same thing, like 250 people and very connected to the land. Just on like a, on a note around this stuff, I can't see my chat anymore. So um, Hillary, if, you, if there's any good questions out there, I think you're gonna have to just uh, pop in and snag me and then I'll hit people or I'll answer those questions. I'm happy to answer questions okay. as we go. Anything so far? Yep, yep. You're, well, actually one question that did come up is, um, I'm not sure if you'll get to this question later, but someone wanted to know if you ever step, try to step in to help animals that you see are maybe in distress or need help in some way. Yeah, you know what, in, in the past when I was younger, I wouldn't do that uh, because I thought I was kind of messing with the natural ecosystem. And if you help one animal, you, you might be hurting a different animal. But as time's gone on, I, I've kind of like loosened up around that. And I will help animals. When I was up in this community of Old Crow, uh, we were like on a river like this. We were like canoeing along or like boating along. I was hunting with some Gwich'in elders. And uh, there was like a caribou calf who had crossed the river. And its parents had, its mom had made it all the way to the top of this huge cliff. And, and it was stuck in the mud at the bottom. And this elder brought our, brought our boat to the side of the river. And we picked up this caribou calf. And we like moved him downstream to a, a nice part where he could get out of the mud, get on a trail that went out right up to his mom, you know. So I learned a lot from that, you know, from this, you know, Gwich'in elder who did that. And so uh, I've kind of like uh, changed my kind of like feelings about that over time. And now if I have an opportunity to help an animal that might need help, I do. <laughs> um yeah, so so like I said, I, I I was a teacher for a long time, and I I was teaching up in Old Crow as soon as I graduated university, and I wanted to go up there to see the caribou because growing up as a kid, I'd seen these cool videos of like, uh, you know, caribou coming out of a forest, and there are like you know thousands of caribou coming out of a forest and swimming across, like going down from the forest into a river, swimming the river and going out the other side. And it was just a constant stream of caribou coming in and out, you know, of the river. It was like a, a, it was like flowing like a river. And ever since then, I wanted to see, you know, the caribou, those, you know, groups of 100,000 caribou. Like, it's just been a dream ever since then. And uh, I got to see them this summer. And this is one of the photos from that. You can see, like, this is taken in slow motion so that uh, some of the caribou are still and then some of them are moving and the water is moving. It's like a one second uh, exposure photo but that, that's what brought me to old crow was to see the caribou and it's my friend jeffrey Nukon. he's a gwich'in hunter in old crow and the gwich'in are caribou people they live in about 14 different uh, villages and they're all around the range of the caribou herd through alaska yukon and um, northwest territories um, and their villages are like at the right at the outskirts of the range of the herd. So they all like the villages see the caribou once or twice a year and have depended on the caribou as their primary food source forever. And they still do, you know, they still like things are changing slowly as we get more food to those communities and the prices get a little better, but they still depend on the caribou. And you can see this guy's like watching a caribou hide, which they use as like uh, sleeping blankets um, for when they go camping, they use them like uh, air mattresses, like we would use like uh, when we go hiking. Um, they use caribou hide to sleep on. It's really warm. It's like a super warm uh, thermo rest. And and uh, you know it's cool about the caribou because they're like or the, the Gwich'in and the caribou. They've had this relationship that's thousands of years old, and it's just adjusting. You know, like it, you know, it's it's uh, moving up in time, and. You know the Gwich'in are trying to balance. You know that you know living their their lifestyle from a you know a hundred years ago or two hundred years ago in a modern world today with all the changes they have with like iPads and entertainment and stuff. 
I showed this picture one time. I tried to sell the story to National Geographic about these caribou people. And I showed this picture to one of the editors one time, one of the top editors at National Geographic. And they're like, they, they were like, oh man, that's a great picture, but really you missed the best shot. The best photo is actually like uh, the photo that the kid took, <laughs> you know, not, not the photo I took, which is pretty cool, you know? And I work with a lot of like uh, First Nation kids. I mentor them and it's neat now because technology um, has changed the world so much that uh, like a small kid in Old Crow can become a world famous photographer with Instagram and an iPhone now. Whereas before, like if you, you couldn't become a professional photographer, like documenting all these things, unless you lived in a big city center like Vancouver or New York. But now like, you know, living in one of these little communities, uh, the, you know, the world's reach has gotten so good. You know, all you need is talent. You've got that talent, you've got the skills. If you're a good enough photographer, um, you know, you can make it. And then, so uh, like I mentor uh, a number of like super talented um, wildlife and, and cultural photographers from these communities. And it's cool, like, uh, you know, I do a lot of hunting with, uh, um, uh, well, I, I, I grew up in a, like the Yukon is almost the size of Alaska, about half the size of Alaska, but only has 40,000 people. Um, and so uh, a lot of people hunt. And one of the cool things about with hunting with First Nations is how they use all the different parts of the body. You know, they get a little offended sometimes by non-First Nations people who leave things like the, the guts and the heads of animals because coming from our culture, um, we don't know how to cook guts and we don't know how to cook the heads and we don't know how to cook the food inside the bones, the marrow. Whereas for them, that's some of the best foods. And so, um, you know, it's something to, to really appreciate about those communities in that kind of traditional culture and lifestyle. This is the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Okay, so this is where the caribou go to have their calves. And you can see the calving area like this, like if uh, if you, you come at the bottom of the screen and keep going down, you'd get to the Arctic Ocean. And so the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge has this vast open plain between the Arctic Ocean and the mountains. And it's where all the caribou come to calve. Um, and you know you have two hundred thousand caribou, you know who migrate. They have the longest land mammal, land mammal migration in the world. And they migrate up to this coastal plain to give birth to their calves. It's like an incredibly important part of the caribou of all their of all their like uh, uh, territory. You know their range. This is the most important part of their range, and their range is huge. I don't know what's it'd be like a combination of three or four states. Um, and when they get there. You know, they get there in early spring and all of a sudden 40 or 50,000 caribou are born in a matter of two days. And it's just an incredible sight, you know, as all these little caribou are born. And within 24 hours, uh, they're able to outrun grizzly bears because all these grizzly bears go up there to try to feed on the caribou calves. And it only takes them 24 hours before they can outrun a grizzly bear. And grizzly bears are fast, like really fast. So it's incredible how quickly they, they kind of like have been able to adapt to escape predators. But the one thing that, that, that they're having trouble with or that they could have trouble with in escaping is like oil and gas development. And so the big issue is like where they have their, their calves, it happens to be uh, on top of huge oil and gas fields up in the northern Alaska in the 1002 lands. And, um, and those were recently opened up to oil and gas development, although no oil and gas development has have happened up there so far. Um, you know, there seems to be a good push from companies and, and the public and the world to like not develop on the cavern grounds of the caribou. And so it hasn't happened yet but it's a super big danger. Like if oil and gas development happens up there in the middle of these cabin grounds for 200,000 caribou, and, and this cabin grounds is a small area, you could see like in that picture, you know, you could see the mountains, it's like, you know, 25 miles deep, maybe a hundred miles wide, like which is very small for 200,000 caribou. And the Gwich'in people who've been like, um, you know, they've been working on protecting this land for over 50 years and trying to get this cabin grounds protected because it's sacred to them. And like they're caribou people, they depend entirely on these, or not entirely, but they depend and culturally and physically on these caribou for so long. And, and they have an important like a you know, like bond with the caribou that goes beyond, you know, what maybe we can understand in our culture. Um, 
that, that, and so they're working really hard to protect that area. And for them, they don't see it as an environmental issue. They see it more as a, a human rights issue. You know, this is some, some spot that's been so important to them for so long and it needs to get protected so that their culture can kind of thrive and survive. Uh, Peter, one thing that uh, someone is wondering is around the, I mean, I know that there are multiple caribou herds that cross the territory where the Willow Project was recently approved. I think there's the Teshekpuk Lake caribou herd. And um, I believe that the porcupine caribou do go relatively close to where Willow would be approved. But um, the question was specifically, are the Gwich'in threatened by the Willow Project? And, do, and are, are you, um, I don't know, do you have relationships with other indigenous groups that are threatened by Willow and concerned about that as well? Because I know there are other indigenous people that are not Gwich'in that are also paying really close attention to this. Well, no, um, the Willow Project does not affect the Gwich'in. It's outside of their traditional territory. It's right at the edge of the, the range of the porcupine caribou herd. And so it's not something that they have really weighed in on because they have so much to work on their traditional territory and their caribou. Um, I have worked with some of the people uh, who would be affected by the Willow Project, but mostly the Anupiat and the Anupiak people up on the Arctic coast. I haven't worked with the inland First Nations who would be most affected. So I don't have too much experience, um, you know, around the Willow Project, to be honest. Um, I just know, like I, I've done work, my Wolverine work, which we'll come to in a little bit, would be more focused on like um, that area. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, it's it's just incredible too. Like, so, you know, this cabin grounds where the caribou go, this 1002 lens, it's the only spot within their range of the herd. Like the range of the herd is like bigger than Scotland. Um, and, you know, the only spot where they can have their calves is this 1002 land because it's the only spot where they have all the grasses and sedges. It's not like, uh, you know, tundra and mountains. It's just in forests. It's just grasses and sedges. It's exactly what they need, exactly where they need it. And that's why they have the world's longest mammal migration to go there because it's so important for them to go and have their babies there in a nice, safe place. Um, this is a, a like a Gwich'in advocate. Her name is Princess. She's pretty famous. Um, she's from Alaska, the, the village of Arctic Village, although she lives in Fairbanks now. And she put it really well one time. She said, like, uh, you know, for you, for when you have a baby, you need to be in a safe place, like in a hospital, in a nursery. And so that's not just people, she says, you know, the caribou need that too. You need to be in a, in a place that's really safe, um, you know, to have their babies, to feel safe, to be uh, for them to, to have the best chance at survival and thriving in this world. They're just like people that way. And that's what the 1002 lands are. That's what the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is. And that's what they've been fighting for forever to uh, to protect. Um, Hillary, I'm going to move on to the Wolverine stuff now. Any questions on the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge? Or are we all good? Well, there are a few questions about um, Old Crow um, and the village. So maybe I can ask you them right now since you have a pause. Um, yeah. One of them is actually a great question too, um, as we look to think about ways that people can make a living all over the world, even in places that are remote. Someone wants to know if they have internet access in a way out there. They do now, but it's very, very slow. So somehow they have it with like Starlink and some other stuff, but you can't send, like I, I work with these photographers. I'm like, send me a photo. And they really struggle to be able to send one photo out. Like, a, yeah. Yeah, okay. And then kind of along those lines, the boy with his iPad, do you feel like there's similar levels of technology up, up in Old Crow or... No. Yeah, yeah, there are like, uh, like, so again, I'm gonna go back to these kids I mentor up there, like they have really good technology up there. And so, you know, I'm older now, I'm 50. 
And so this, a lot of the kids I mentor are like 25 and they have a lot more technological uh, knowledge than I do. So like I help them with the business side of thing, with the art side of thing, you know, things that they don't have, you know, things you might call like say white privilege, because I grew up with all these things being part of my like um, upbringing, you know? And so I know how to navigate this world really well. I know how to deal with editors in New York city uh, whereas these people that grew up in the communities, they don't have that stuff. They don't know how to deal with editors in New York City. So I help them with that kind of stuff. Um, and then they help me with the technological stuff because they're better at all that stuff because they're young, you know? And so they, uh -huh. they're no different from a kid in New York in terms of the technology. And they're like, they, you know, like they play video games nonstop all the time. Um, and so they're, they're, they do very well in that, in that kind of thing. Uh, just like cool. any other, like, yeah. Okay. Um, and then regarding the photo before, the people were wondering where that industrialization was. And was it combined with the calving that was happening or were those, those two separate images? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I should have explained that. Uh, so those uh, were the oil fields of Prudhoe Bay. And so those oil fields are just to the west of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And so um, they are around the, the NPRA and um, yeah. And, and so they're, you know, obviously they're very big. They're very impactful. They've affected some of the other caribou herds, but those kind of oil fields are what gonna, as what gonna happen in Arctic National Wildlife Refuge if oil development proceeds there. And that's what, you know, the Gwich'in are trying to stop because they just don't see that compatible with having a safe place for a nursery with caribou. Um, and, and yeah, there's... Um, oh, just a question about NPRA. That's the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska, and we often refer to it as the reserve, um, where they're actually, it's full of wildlife, and much of it has not been developed at all for the purposes of petroleum, and Alaska Wilderness League has been doing a ton of work to help protect a lot of ecologically sensitive areas in the reserve, um, and Peter as well has part of this episode tonight, we'll look at some of the pho photography that he's taken in this area where um, it is more wild. Yeah, yeah, like this is where the next story will be coming from. Um, and it's a real wilderness out there. Um, and the next story is about, um, oh, uh, about wolverines. I forgot I was going to mention one thing before I got into wolverines. And it was like, uh, I want to do this story on golden eagles. And so the golden eagles, there's this really neat story about golden eagles and caribou because the golden eagles that, uh, are the main predator of caribou calves in the first year of life for the caribou, which is a real surprise, you know, like people don't realize that. And uh, you have these like uh, these golden eagles that go up there and they're golden eagles that don't have a home range. They're golden eagles that are just kind of making their way in the world. They've been kicked out of their nests They've been out on their own for a couple months and they need food. And so they all kind of flock up to the Arctic refuge and they live in the mountains. And when the caribou come near the mountains, um, they get the, the uh, caribou calves. And so, uh, you know, a big part of, of, uh, of my presentation tonight is about how um, the caribou are important for more than just the Gwich'in. The caribou in feed the entire Northern landscape. Um, they're like the salmon of the North Slope. You know, they are what the entire landscape depends on. And the porcupine caribou herd is one of the, the only caribou herds in North America that's growing and healthy and has no concerns and is doing well. Most of the caribou herds in North America are really struggling and, and scientists don't know why they have natural fluctuations, um, but they're concerned it's beyond natural fluctuations, but they don't know why. Um, and so we're lucky that the porcupine caribou herd are doing so well. And, you know, like the caribou, you know, they, they, they cover this huge, huge area. And they just, that's what they do is they just feed everybody. They feed wolves, wolverines, you know, ravens, eagles, foxes, people, and the landscape as well. Like they're so important. Their body, you know, when it provides so much nutrition to like a very, like a, uh, low ecologically valued landscape you know there's not a lot of like uh, soil up there um 
And so, you know, the caribou are just the most critical part of the entire landscape of, of the north, northern Alaska and northern Yukon. And one of the things they, they feed is, is uh, wolverines. And so uh, I, was, I was trying to do a story at one point, and I was like, oh, I want to get into National Geographic. And so I'm like, what should I do a story about? And I was like thinking of some of these great photographers of the past, how they did stories for National Geographic. And they would photograph things that were impossible to photograph, like the snow leopard. And so I was like, okay, what's, what's like the snow leopard? What's something you can't see or photograph ever? And I've come across maybe 200 wild wolves in, in, in the north. So I see wolves often. But one thing I'd never seen was wolverines. And so I thought, you know what? I'm going to try to do a story on wolverines. And this is a little female wolverine in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. This photo was taken with like a remote camera. And it was a neat story because these we found these caribou. I was working with a team of biologists who I'll talk about in a bit. And we found these caribou who had been chased over cliffs by wolves. And about seven of the caribou had died by being chased over these cliffs. And uh, I set up this camera to kind of document the animals feeding on these caribou. And I ended up seeing um, a, a dozen golden eagles, three wolverines, grizzly bears, arctic foxes, wolves, you know, just everything was coming to feed on these caribou. And so for a month, it was just a busy hillside as all the animals in the area, you know, had smelt these caribou and came, found them and, and were feeding on them. And these would have been, you know, members of either the porcupine caribou herd or the central Arctic caribou herd, which is the other caribou herd that I focused that is like, that would be one of the herds that would be affected by the Willow Project. And these, you know, like when, when we were studying these wolverines, we learned all sorts of neat stuff. I was working with these pilots who like uh, track wolverines. And one of the things that they told me was one day they were tracking a wolverine tracks and they saw it uh, intersect with uh, caribou tracks. So they followed the caribou tracks and the wolverine tracks. And um, they followed it for 30 miles. And this wolverine had chased a caribou for 30 miles until that caribou was so tired it just collapsed and the wolverine could could... Uh, kill it and eat it like these wolverines are like the, some of the toughest animals around you know imagine doing that you know that, they're not that fast they can't catch something but they can run things down much like people are believed to have done in Africa you know thousands of years ago was like you know you might not be as fast as an antelope but it, we can run for 24 hours whereas an antelope can't run for 24 hours it can sprint really fast but can't run for 24 hours and the other neat thing about wolverines, I don't know if you can see that wolverine there just in that little patch of sun uh, on the snow. The other cool things about wolverines that they're known for is they don't understand that the world's not flat. And so like a, a wolverine doesn't change its pace going on flat ground or going straight up a mountain. They just, they see the whole world as flat. So 99% of animals, if they want to get from one valley to another, will, will, will go along the flat ground of the valleys and go around the mountain. But wolverines don't, they just go up and over because it's like nothing to them, you know? And there's these wolverines call, um, collared in like Glacier National Park. And there was some summit that was like really hard to like, uh, like the high, highest mountain in the area. It was really hard for, for, you know, people to climb. And it was a big thing. Like people would go in and mountain climb it and do 24 hour pushes to get it done. And, and one day this wolverine just went straight up it in two hours and down the other side, like it was nothing. <laughs> You know, so they're pretty, I don't know, they're pretty cool animals, you know, they got a neat story to them and they're tough and they have this reputation for being really ferocious, really vicious. And, and I think they can be sometimes, but their, their reputation is also really overblown. This is a, a, a biologist, a wolverine biologist named Tom Glass, and he's with the Wildlife Conservation Society in Alaska. And he was doing a study on wolverines. And so when I was doing my wolverine photography, I asked him if I could basically follow him around for a couple months a year, and he let me. And uh, that's where I got my Wolverine photos and, and learned about, you know, the story he was doing. And when we were doing these stories, you know, we were like canoeing across on these like white, you know, it's all winter up there when we were going. It was in, like in uh, January to March, and we're canoeing across these just white landscapes where you could hardly see anything. Um, it, it's really hard to find animals, you know. You, you think that the land is almost not not alive but it is and like this right now like this is what they call a whiteout 
and you think it's like snowing or something, but it's not even snowing. Like what happens in a, often in these whiteouts is the wind blows and it's like flat up there and there's Arctic Ocean just beyond. It's kind of like that coastal plain where the caribou calve, only it's further west and it's a little bigger. And so when the wind blows, it just picks up all the snow. And like, so if I'm in this snowstorm right here and I look straight up, I can see blue skies up above. But what, I, what happens is there's 100 or 200 feet of snow blowing from the ocean and from the land, you know, just with strong winds. And so it looks like it's, you're in a snowstorm, but it's re just blowing snow, you know, it's not actually snowing. And so what these biologists were doing was they would, you know, they would live capture wolverines in a box like this. And so this is a fox. These foxes are smart animals and they would outsmart the biologists all the time because this fox would like, uh, jump inside this uh, this box and it would uh, close on him and there'd be a bunch of food in there for the wolverine and he'd just sit in there eating the food for the wolverine in this nice warm spot until the biologist came and so the biologist you know they had to get to this box in 12 hours because you can see how sturdy that box is but um, the wolverines could chew their way out of that box in 12 hours that's how strong they are and so you had to get there pretty quick because you didn't want this wolverine to be wasting all this energy chewing, it's trying to chew its way through a box. And so we'd get the uh, email because this would have like a, um, like a little email that, like trigger on it. So as soon as the, there was an animal in the box and it was closed, we'd get an email and then we'd rush out as fast as we could. And there'd be this fox just happy as could be eating some food and we'd close it up, put some more food in there, leave. And maybe two days later, we'd get a call back out there to see this fox just enjoying life in the nice warm hay filled box with a bunch of free food. <laughs> uh, but every now and then um, we'd, uh, we'd get to one of these boxes in a snowstorm and you'd look inside and there would be a, a wolverine. Um, and, and you'd think they'd be like snarling and vicious and, and attacking, but they weren't, you know, they have that reputation. And I think that reputation isn't fully deserved because I've had a lot of wolverine encounters now in my life, and I've never had one where they were aggressive. I've had maybe 30, um, you know, and I've never had an aggressive one. And so what happens is with the wolverine like this, they, they put it under, um, and then they, they, they weigh it, they check all its measurements, they check its health, um, and then they fit it with a GPS collar that would stay on it for uh, three months. So this collar would be on the Wolverine for three months. And, um, you know, then they would, you know, they'd release it and then they'd follow the data. This, this is like the biologist checking its teeth. Uh, a good way to see how old uh, and how healthy a Wolverine is, is by checking its teeth. And so this guy's, you know, he looks pretty healthy, but not like a, you know, a baby one-year-old or two-year-old Wolverine with perfect teeth, but, but pretty, pretty good shape. This is the biologist Tom Klein, and this is when the wolverines like uh, under. They have him in a tent. They got to keep his body temperature warm, so he's covered in a sleeping bag. And they, there you can see a little bit of that GPS collar on him. They have a little nice little um, hat over his eyes, so it's nice and dark. So if he does slowly start waking up, he's still calm. And then when they release him, off he goes. Um, you know, back out to to do what they do, which is just run around constantly, never stopping, looking for food. And so what they're trying to figure out with these GPS collars uh, was they wanna figure out how important snow is to wolverines because the world's changing so much. And especially down in the lower 48, wolverines are really heavily reliant on denning and snow. And so they're trying to get some data on denning and snow on the north to get an idea of how important it is down south because down south, snow is disappearing much, like really fast. And uh, up north, you know, they, are, they, they also need that snow and maybe there's gonna be more snow or less snow, but they need to have like big snow, um, like piles, like wind drifts to den in um, and build these like snow holes. And so the study was really kind of figuring how important snow is to denning and to other things like up north, they use snow to get away from predators too. Um, and 
because there's no trees like down south they climb up trees to get away from predators but up north there's no way to get away from predators because it's just like a flat open like plain everywhere and so what do they do they dig these snow holes all over their territory and then if they come across a predator they race to these snow holes and hide in them and this is a wolf that we saw uh, there's a really nice pack of wolves in the same area and this guy was like uh jumping after like those lemmings you know he's jumping and what we're watching him like he's a young guy and he would just like uh jump and try to catch lemmings all the time in the snow Hillary, any questions on the uh, Wolverine so far? Or am I good to keep going? I have a few questions, but I think I'm going to save some of them for later. The one that I wanted to ask you right now was about the collars. If they stay on for three months, like how do they fall off? I, I don't know the like the technical way they do it, but they're just designed so that they like fall off after three months. I imagine it's like um, held together with a certain cloth that only lasts three three months in the outdoors. I just think it's something like that. I don't think it's like uh, related to like a um, some sort of mechanical release because uh -huh. those mechanical releases wouldn't you know might not work. Okay. And so yeah, that's what I think. Um, yeah. So I wanted to like one of the other photo stories I'd love to do one day is on the relationship between wolves and wolverines because they got this cool relationship because like wolverines rely on on wolves for food they very rarely catch caribou on their own but wolves are catching lots of caribou and the wolves will feed on caribou um and then uh they'll leave and come back and feed on the caribou again and when they leave the wolverines will get in there and eat that caribou and like they'll what the wolverine will do is that they'll drag that caribou apart and bury it in holes all over the place and so the wolves don't like the wolverines very much because they steal their caribou. And, and so if a wolverine sees a wolf, they'll chase it down and attack it and kill it. And so every now and then you come to these sites where you find uh, a, a, a caribou or a moose or something and a dead wolverine there too, because the wolverine couldn't get away in time to one of its snow holes. But the wolverines also depend on the caribou. So they got this kind of funny relationship where it's like symbiotic in some ways, but not in others, you know? And the, and the wolves catch a lot of caribou and it's a huge food source for these wolverines. If they can get a caribou that's just been killed, you know, they can get food for a month. Um, and just if they can get, get it stowed away in their little snow holes before the wolves get back. Um, and, and so we, one day when we were out in the field, we came across uh, a freshly killed uh, caribou by wolves. It was, had just been killed and the snowmobiles pulled up and having to scare the wolves off. So I quickly put up a camera and left, hoping that the wolves would come back and I'd get some photos. Um, but the wolves didn't come back, but what did come was a, um, a uh, Arctic fox. You can see him in the corner there. He's like a ghost. And, and at first I didn't like that photo because that fox is like, uh, you know, it's not sharp. It's like, this is a long exposure photo, like one or two seconds. And so that fox was moving. So it's like, it looks more like a ghost. But I also think that's what like Arctic fox are. They're like Arctic ghosts. You hardly ever see them. And so it's one of my favorite photos now because it kind of tells the story of the Arctic fox and how you rarely see them. And again, it's another, another one of these animals that depends on caribou up in the north. Like the wolf, you know. And here's a here's a uh, a uh, a wolverine on a caribou carcass. You can see he's like been eating, been moving food around, and he's he's getting up on the caribou carcass to look around. You know, so he's always got got to be watchful. He's got to be like grabbing food, bring it to his hole, and then looking around for more food, like like for wolves and foxes and anything that might be coming up to kind of give him a hard time. Oh shoot! How do the wolverines? Uh, travel for so far do they just have incredible lung capacity or what do people know about their cardiovascular system and how they can sustain these difficult hikes i don't know that to be honest like i i know that they they must have like you know a very strong system for that they're kind of thought of like as humans that can go for a long time but can't go for really fast but i don't have any details on on that one of the things i do know is like they're they're famous for being good on snow because you know, like this is their hand, right? And so they have decent sized hands, but when they're moving on snow, they don't use their hand only. They use this entire part like a foot. 
So kind of like if I we were, if we were to be crawling around on our hands and knees on snow, we wouldn't see uh, like fall as deep in. And that's what the Wolverine do. They kind of use from their elbow to their fingers as their uh, as their hands. So they don't like they're like big snowshoes. And that's why they're they, they're kind of like thrive in snow. And that's why they need snow. You know, they're real snow machines. This is a, a Wolverine and you can see that's a snow hole there. So that's what they were trying to figure out, like learn about was, you know, their, the, the importance of these snow holes to the Wolverines. And, and they're like, they, they'd have these snow holes all over and all the animals that are out in the land, when they would find one of these snow holes, they'd always come to investigate, you know? So here's a, here's a fox going to look inside a Wolverine den. And I would imagine that'd be pretty scary if you're a fox going into a Wolverine den and finding a Wolverine in there. But some of the animals are going and looking for wolverine dens to, to find little babies. What's the relationship between the um, red foxes and the Arctic foxes? Do you know if they're um, if they have the overlapping territory in the Arctic? You know, that's that a good a question. question. One of the things I'm gonna I'll answer that at the end. I'm gonna do a little like uh, four four photos about that because it's another oh, full great. story. It's so interesting. And this is this is the uh, that those are little baby wolverines leaving the the den with their mom, you know, for the first time ever. They they just come out the once and then they take off and they start roaming the land with their mom, looking for food. One time, like I was, one of the things I needed for my story was like a photo of uh, of wolverine going into its den. And so what I did was I stuck. I, we found the spot where. Uh, wolverines were like getting a wolverine was getting fish out of this frozen river so it was digging under this river to get fish and there was like six holes so I felt comfortable putting like a camera trap in one of the holes and we came back to pick up my camera trap like a couple months later or a, a couple weeks later and I it, and the whole area was just torn to shreds all the holes were ripped open and and we looked at my camera and we see this photo of a grizzly bear so this grizzly bear had come to investigate the holes and it had torn all these like holes apart and it ruined my photo. I could have had a really good photo of Wolverine instead I got a photo of this stupid grizzly bear. <laughs> I'm kidding, it's a pretty cool photo of a grizzly it's bear. It's such a cool photo though. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was mad at first, but it was like, no, oh, it's really cool. And we would find a lot of these grizzly bear dens in the spring when we're moving around because we'd find these tracks and you'd track them back and you'd see so this is the two biologists tom and matt the wolverine biologists and crawled inside a grizzly den and then i crawled inside that den to look out and uh it was really neat seeing the grizzlies coming out in the spring because uh you know they'd be coming out of their dens and it'd be snow uh you know and they start looking for uh food you know and they start moving north towards the caribou cabin grounds Again, another one of these animals, it's like all the animals in the north that depend on caribou. Um, and so they would, you know, be looking for just anything they can find to eat. And one of the neat stories up there is about muskox and grizzly bears. And so it's a little long story. I'll tell you as quick as I can. But like the, so they reintroduced muskox up there. They were all killed out, I think, by whaling about 100 years ago, or I'm not sure how long ago, but they were missing for a long time. So I think in the 60s or 70s, they introduced musk oxen back up there. And the musk oxen are doing really well right now. But at one point, their numbers started really dropping. And they were worried about them, and they couldn't figure out why. And then they found out there was this like, there was this one uh, grizzly bear mom who learned how to hunt and kill musk ox. And musk oxen don't have very good defense against grizzly bears, because their defense is to like, get in a circle to protect their young. From, from wolves and stuff, and wolves can't break that circle, but grizzly bears are big enough too. So the grizzly bears can get the musk oxen. And so this one mom had learned how to, to, to get uh, musk oxen. And then it had a couple cubs and its cubs learned how, and then its, its cubs, you know, its cubs had more cubs. And before you knew it, there was like seven or eight grizzly bears that knew how to get musk oxen up there. And it became such a problem. They were killing so many musk oxen that uh, the government went in and had to, put down those grizzly bears, which is, I don't, I'm torn about that because I, I don't know how I feel about it, but it's an interesting story, you know, about how these like, you know, grizzly bears learned how to kill musk ox and then almost wiped out this entire population of musk ox. And, and you think at some point in the near future, more grizzly bears are going to do it. And hopefully the musk ox and population is like healthy enough now that it can, it can uh, survive through that. But, uh, yeah, you know, it, really interesting story. 
this is a pair of foxes. I, I put up this camera trap on top of a, a, a wolverine den. And it, a snowstorm came, covered up the den, so you can't even see the hole. The hole is right beneath that fox's nose. And when this pair of foxes came by looking for that hole, you know, they could smell it. Um, and the wolverine was still in there with its kits. And so this gets that red fox and uh, an Arctic fox story. Like red fox are moving north. You know, they, they start moving north with climate change, but also with like the roads and the, uh, the industrial activity uh, of people has kind of brought the red foxes north. And so there's an interesting relationship with red fox and Arctic fox because uh, sometimes they can share food sources, but there's also conflict between red fox and Arctic fox. And red fox will sometimes wipe out the Arctic fox populations. They'll kill them for food if they're hungry and there's not enough food around. And they also steal their dens. And so, uh, you know, it's another story I want to do is about the red fox and the Arctic fox and and do a story on like urban Arctic fox, kind of like I did on the the uh, urban red fox in, in Whitehorse. I'd like to do a story on urban Arctic fox up in Alaska. And right now there's a big rabies uh, epidemic going through. It, it goes through every couple of decades. Um, and right now up in, on the North Slope, there's like a rabies uh, epidemic going through um, Alaska. And I think that's it, folks. That's my presentation. Oh my gosh, with... Peter, this has been amazing. Um, there are still a ton of questions. So oh, cool. um, yes, let me just, um, okay, hang on. I'm gonna pull through all of these questions and get to the top. Um, let me see. Okay, well, just really briefly before we get to the questions, I just want to thank everyone who has come to the Geography of Hope tonight with Peter and also thank all of you who donated to support our Geography of Hope episodes, as well as all of you who stepped up to donate and help with our fundraising campaign this weekend to protect polar bears and all the diverse species of what life that rely on wild Alaska. Um, we had a match, a matching gift drive, and we really appreciate everyone who stepped up to contribute. So Thank you all, and thank you to our monthly donors who every single month help support all of this work. So now I'm going to go to our questions. Um, so one of the first questions that I held until later was around reindeer. Um, one of the person, one of the people asked if um, the reindeer. Um, hides that they use for blankets shed a lot um like once they're once they're as a blanket they don't shed yes. at all oh yeah yeah they don't shed at all i'm not sure why but i've I used a couple did your biggest uh worry with them is if your dog gets at them your dog will rip them to shreds i had a beautiful one that my dog ripped to shreds oh. um because i didn't know any better but yeah once you have those they don't shed you you just like you hang them outside your house you pin them to your house what they do is they nail them to their house and stretch them out and scrape them a little bit and then they just let them sit there for a month and then after that they're all set to be used as a as a as a hide and they tend to just use them at the one time a year in the like the best time of year i think i forget the best time of year yeah okay I, i'm just going to kind of go through some of these questions not in an organized order but just on in the order they came um and this is another fox question um, are when you were do, showing all your photos of the urban foxes, it seemed like you were able to get pretty close to them. Like, do the mothers get angry at you, or how how does that dynamic work? Well, like the urban foxes were pretty used to people, you know, and so the, the like the, if I would just sit in a, in a spot and stay still, then the foxes would come to me. And so if I would just stay in one spot for a couple hours, the foxes would come to me and they got pretty used to me too, because I would try to go there at night when they were more active. And when the, um, there wasn't as many people around. So then they would kind of like know who I was and get used to me. And so that's how I kind of like uh, was able to get so close to them, but they're also urban foxes. So they're very used to people. So, you know, that also makes it why you can get close to them where you couldn't in the wild. It would take you a little, really long time and you'd have to find a really like friendly fox family that was like tolerant. Like most wildlife photography is like, you know, you see a thousand bears and you find one that's tolerant enough to let you approach in a safe way. 
and that's uh-huh. where you get your, you know and so with urban foxes you don't have to worry that so much because they're all tolerant but like when you're doing photos of foxes in the wild you'd have to find 100 fox families before you found one that that kind of accepted you and didn't mind you being there huh. oh that's so interesting um okay and then let's see oh another question was how cold does it get up there in the old um, Pro village and the those villages you know, like it gets very cold. Like well, I'm in I'm in Canada, so I know everything in Celsius. And when I was up working on the Wolverine stuff, that's the coldest I ever got. And we would go out snowmobiling on days when it was minus 51 um, Celsius, which I'm not oh, sure wow. what it is Fahrenheit, but it's probably pretty close. And like one day, you know, I slipped, my, I, I slipped my my foot went into the water, and then uh, like in a creek. And so you, when your foot gets wet, you just, or when something gets wet, you just covered it with snow really quickly because the snow will suck up all the water before it gets through your layers of clothing, you know, but uh, huh. yeah, that, that's the biggest issue up there is it gets pretty cold. I cannot imagine staying warm <laughs> in that temperature. <laughs> um, yeah. So another question, I'm bringing us back to the caribou calves and the eagles. How does that happen? How are the eagles able to prey on the caribou calves? Well, I mean, it's a little bit harsh, uh, but they basically, they, they just swoop down and they've got those sharp talons and the caribou calves are so like sensitive. You just get a caribou calf with that talon anywhere, make a, you know, a pretty long, like you're flying, you make a cut along the caribou somewhere and, and it's first months of life, it can't really do much after that. And so then the you know, the caribou just be, get left behind and then the, the eagle get it. It's sad. Um, you know, that's a tough thing I see a lot of was like uh, caribou calves. You know, they feed a lot of the animals out there, which is kind of sad too. There was one time I was with this uh, herd of like a uh, 100,000 caribou. Like I finally got in one of these herds where there's 100,000 caribou and it took like 18 hours for it to go by me. And afterwards wow. you see, see all these caribou calves on their own that they kind of get lost from their moms and I always thought that they would just get lost and they'd be food for other animals and so you know we hiked behind these caribou for a couple days following the caribou to see what would you know happen and as we were going we were really shocked to see that all those caribou calves like two three days after they'd been left their moms would find them and then they would pass us and catch it going to catch up to the herd because I always thought like those caribou calves were just lost once they're the, the herd had left them, but the moms are like, we will stick around for days until they find the caribou and, and then take them to catch up. So that was really cool because we actually had to see it happen a couple of times. And then we would just see them passing us, you know, as that caribou herd had passed like four days ago, all of a sudden we'd see a mom and a calf who'd found each other running to catch up. And those often the calves would see us and be like, are you my mom? And they'd come running <laughs> up to us. It was cool that they found their moms. Oh my gosh. That's so cool. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, well, that was a happier e- ending to that <laughs> that little story. <laughs> um, I mean, not for the eagles necessarily, but um, so another person asked about your Instagram post about the Yukon ice grizzlies. Um, they they're curious about. I don't actually know about this, so I'll just ask the question. There's a Bear Cave Mountain camp and. I guess it's closed right now. So yeah. because of salmon loss. Yeah. Yeah. What so I did a, about that. I've been doing a big story on these ice bears. So it's these bears that depend on like stay out late into winter and, and, and fish on late salmon runs. So the salmon are coming up in December, in Jan in November and in December, and the bears go in the water to catch these salmon. And when they get out, it's so cold that when the water is dripping off their fur, they uh it freezes and creates all these icicles on them. But it's a big issue because these, uh, the salmon are disappearing all across the north. And so like that bear cave camp is a really famous camp where I've been once and people go to photograph bears that that are covered in ice and there's not enough salmon there anymore. There used to be like, when the guy first started the camp, there was 350,000 salmon that went up there. And then the last couple of years, there hasn't been 2000 salmon. So- Oh, wow. Yeah, so like the salmon really feed, you know, more of the interior north of Alaska and the Yukon, and they're disappearing, whereas the caribou, fit, fit, you know, are in the far north, and they're still healthy right now, 
Um, although we were really worried about, you know, what's going to happen if you, you know, develop in their calving grounds. And so, you know, we got to do two things. We got to help those salmon better. We got to protect the salmon with the overfishing in the ocean. And then we got to make sure the same thing doesn't happen to the caribou. Um, let's see. How old do caribou grow to be if they're not someone's dinner I, I think like an old caribou is like seven or eight years old they have pretty short lifespans you know yeah um okay and then uh we talked a little bit about the red fox spraying on arctic foxes so i think you've covered that kind of topic of the perhaps the red foxes are moving up north maybe due to climate change and there's a competition between them did, did you want to add anything else to that that is something people were interested in? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, that's something I'd like to, to delve into more in terms of, uh, of a story, because um, I don't know too much more than that. Okay. You know, you know, like I think one of the things that the other things I know that is uh, could be a problem is these red foxes are very good at catching some of the stuff that uh, Arctic foxes don't. So there's like these huge colonies of uh, birds that are on, live on cliffs up on the Arctic and the red foxes can jump along those cliffs and the Arctic fox can't and they can get, they get a lot of those colonies eggs. And so there's, uh, there's yeah, but I really got to do more research on all this stuff for that story because it's a whole story when it's within itself. And I hope one day I can find the time and the money and the, and the uh, resources to go out and do it because that's something I'd really like to do. Cool. Um, I noticed in that box with the Wolverine in it that there, it looked like there were claw marks inside the box. Do you, is there a way that Wolverines sharpen their claws? I don't know of, of them, of them doing anything to sharpen their claws. No, I don't know of anything doing anything to sharpen their claws, to be honest. Uh-huh. Well, I guess that. there's bears, whatever they're doing on trees sometimes. I don't know if that's actually sharpening or just saying, this is my tree. <laughs> I know when they do that on trees, they're definitely saying, like, they're definitely marking their territory. But I okay. don't know if it also sharpens their claws. Maybe it does. I couldn't tell you. Okay. Um, oh, so any of the predators that you were featuring today, do any of them eat grasses or twigs or berries or anything? Or is it all... Um, well, I guess the question is, do they do these... Do they eat that in the summer and then it looks like they're eating just meat in the winter. Is that true? Or are there other things? No, I think in the winter, it's just meat. Like they'll, you know, they're surprising though at what they can do. Like they can get, find fish in the winter, uh, you know, caribou, um, other stuff. But in, then in the summer, I think everything eats stuff other than meat. I was going to put a story in here. I never got around to putting it in. I'll share it in a sec. But like the bears, you know, bears are primarily surviving on uh, grasses and um wolves are known to eat berries and, and fish too and so you know they eat a wide variety of stuff the wolverine I, I, one of the really neat things i did with this wolverine guy one time was we had one of these uh, wolverines with a satellite collar on it and so we went to check all of its, its locations one day and it had done this big like loop outside of its den and we, we followed it around and it had dug all these holes to get food it had left. And we went through and we saw about eight of these holes. And then when we got to the eighth hole, we stopped and we looked in and there was an egg at the bottom of the hole, <laughs> like a goose. And so we went back and checked all the other, and they were all goose eggs. And so now this was in winter in, in March or uh, April, I think it was April. And so the Wolverine had got these goose eggs 10 months before and stored them in this area around where its den was going to be in the winter. And then in the winter, when it was feeding its babies, it went and got all these goose eggs like 10 months later, which oh. is like incredible, you know, like that, what incredible that it was able to do that, you know? And so I a couple of times of, of Wolverines doing that with goose eggs. So it's pretty neat that they can kind of see that far ahead. And you got to wonder what their brain is thinking if they're like making conscious decisions about, okay, I'm going to store these in this area because I know I can den here in the winter. Yeah. Huh. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, let me see. There's tons of thank yous, Peter. So many people are just saying how great 
Um, I got one here. This I presentation see. was. So I'm searching got, for more questions. I got, I got another one. I can say Nola here asked me, she's like, do you know Renee Rivard on the Klondike Highway? Yeah, yes, I mean, good. I'm glad you found that. Yes. Yeah, and I do know Renee. We're talking on Facebook right now. He's done an incredible work on like these uh, uh, otters that like use underwater ice caves to travel in the winter and to uh, um, they use these open water holes in the winter that get filled with uh, fish. So these fish kind of like find these open water holes. And I, I've seen these up in the Arctic too, where wolverines go and, and you'll find like a thousand grayling in one little pool of open water and they can't move very fast because there's hardly any oxygen. And Rene Rivard, who's in the Yukon, is like an expert at that stuff. So me and Rene are, are talking because I'm hoping I can find enough funding to hire him to do some research for me. And then me and him can go in the field and do a story on these like little winter oases that help the uh, wildlife survive in these harsh winters because they're full of like uh, fish. And so, oh my yeah, gosh. That's what, yeah, so it's kind of funny. It's a small world. There's a bunch of people on here I know and who know people who I know. <laughs> and if anybody yeah. has more questions too, like, uh, you can uh, like email me at, uh, I'll put my email in here, um, peter at petermather.com, or you can go to my Instagram or Facebook or any of those places and find me uh, and, and and ask questions. I love talking to people about, uh, you know, Alaska and, and wilderness and wildlife and the importance of all this stuff. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I think that's through all our questions and we will definitely share Peter's Instagram and his website in our wrap up email. So. Guys, everyone, thanks so much for coming tonight. This is just such a treat. Peter, so glad to have you on. Um, hope you continue to get better. And yeah, we'll have an email for everyone soon. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Thanks so much for, uh, for, for uh, listening to me blather on. Appreciate it. Fantastic. Good night, everyone. Night.